Welcome to episode 227 of the Barcelona Podcast, home to the most influential voices in the FC Barcelona community, brought to you by the Blue Wire Podcast Network. I'm Dan Hilton, and I'm again joined by Frances Tomas, Barca columnist featured on ESPN, The Guardian, all that. And Frances, not only welcome back, but happy belated birthday. Thank you so much. Hola, culés. Um, yeah, I had a, a great day. I had a great week. Um, it was very, very special. Best thing that happened to me all week is was um, turning on Barca TV+. Plus and Barca TV a YouTube channel as well. And uh, I saw a familiar face in there that looked a lot like your face, and it had your name. Dan, how, how did that happen? Well, we, fortunately, and a credit to you on this one, so you and I, you know, we take back the curtain just a little bit on when we have guests on. Either you and I make the connection, and so I have to give credit to you because one of the connections that you did make, it wasn't me this time, but it was you. You had spoken with Sarah Salapour all those years, that being 2017, back in the very first year, infancy of our podcast. So she came on as a guest to episode 40, and it seems like that connection, and she didn't hate her time on our podcast enough to not remember us, so she actually reached back out to us, particularly you, and you were a little tied up with the whole birthday thing and the daughter with a birthday, so I decided to sit in your place and, you know, I want to thank everybody that said nice things about my appearance on FC Barcelona Match Center with Sarah and company in the pregame, halftime, and postgame. So after your feature as a fan earlier this year, Frances, we can now both say that, yes, the club knows that we exist, which is, uh, I guess, a cool feeling. <laughs> so before we get to... I, I don't know if it's a good thing, though. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I don't think, you know, as many people say, I, I had one one particular Twitter troll where he had his fun. But other than that, again, I think everyone's really supportive. And the club knows that uh, we. I don't think we're... We're not ever too nasty, and I I think every critique we ever have of the club has some kind of factual information backing it up, and even of all the criticism we ever gave to Bartomeu, it wound up that the other members agreed, and now he's not a part of the club anymore, so I think we won that one, And but before we do get to La Ronda, I'll answer the quick questions about the appearance for those that, I, the questions I've been seeing, so no, that doesn't change the way we say things here, as well as being critical of the club when, when we need to be, so that's not going to change anything here. Two, I don't know if that was a one-time thing, I'll be on again, who knows? Three, for those that watch the post game, yes, I am a professional play-by-play broadcaster, so I have done highlight readers before, so it wasn't something that took me by surprise to be able to talk over and have a conversation over highlights. Again, I've done it many, many times in my broadcasting career, and yes, I did upgrade my web camera for that appearance, so that's why I looked a little more clear, and yes, that appearance is in the description for this podcast, so you can check it out there, and finally, yes, I did enjoy it. So, all right, with all those questions answered, Frances, are you ready for La Ronda? Yeah, I don't know if we need to do the podcast now. We've done that bit. That's enough, isn't it? (laughs) Well, no, because that's not really under the Barcelona podcast, we'll say, uh, label. That is under FC Barcelona's official verified accounts are taking credit for that. So we're going to have to do our own content and create our own stuff now. So unfortunately, that starts on a rather sour note with the Ansu Fati injury. He's had surgery. He's going to be out for four months. And before I get to these questions, I just want to explain there is a little bit of a debate on why he would be out so long. And what I am seeing is that because he is still just 18 years old and that part of his body, as in every part of his body, is continuing to grow, they are deciding to repair it and hope that it basically gets back to and stitch it up and then hope it gets back to being 100% of what it is. If you have older players who have that kind of meniscus injury, especially those that are in their late 20s and early 30s, many times they will just remove the damaged portion or they will remove the entire thing. And then while it does make the later part of one's life more difficult, it makes it easier for them to get back on the field a little quicker, should we say. But for Fati, they're just doing it the right way so that this may never be a problem again. And I think I think we would all agree that it's absolutely uh, that's obviously the right way to do it. But that's why you're seeing why other players, especially in today's day and age when modern medicine is, I mean, we have seen even in the time that we've done this podcast, in four years, we've seen meniscus injuries, the timetable, and everyone is different, sure, but we have seen the average timetable of meniscus injuries go down two to four to six weeks. 
in so many cases. They are just getting quicker and quicker and quicker at recovery. And the more we're learning about the science behind sports science in particular, these players are just getting, it just, it's a lot easier to get them back to health and in quicker amount of time. So to say it's four months, that might be a lot quicker because Ansu Fadi also, he's come back from a broken leg. Uh, when he broke his leg all those years ago in La Masia, he wound up coming back months before he was supposed to. So he might even be a quick healer. So we don't know, but expect him to be out four months. So that's why these questions come into play. Mod Tahad asks, Pancho, Atso, Pulkit, Antonio. It's all basically the same question. Who's going to step up in his place? And who is going to take those minutes that Ansu Fadi had nailed down on the left wing? Very, very good question. Um, obviously expected as well. Um, I just want to start by saying that we've lost our top goal scorer, really. Right. Uh, you've got Messi, obviously, who has had quite of a slow start to the year uh, by Messi's standards, obviously by anyone else's standards. It's an extraordinary start. Um, but, you know, he's set up his own expectations himself with the performances over the last 20 years. Um, and, you know, Messi really has only scored two or three times from outfield play. Uh, he scored a lot of penalties. But um, actually, you know, we have lost a sharpest weapon in front of goal. So replacing that is impossible, basically. Uh, we just have to wait until Ansu recovers fully. Um, and the key word there is fully. We don't want... I know you just mentioned about rushing through. I think that's more to do with, as you mentioned as well, with the recovery uh, mechanisms and, and, and processes and, and timings than actually the, the doctors rushing through what naturally would not happen. So in other words, Anthony needs to take as long as he needs. He's 18 years old. Um, hopefully he's got another 14, 15 years playing at Barca. So we need to get him back fully, back to what he was before the injury. Um, there's no... With injuries, you always think about what could happen next, but I'm not really afraid or scared that Ansu will not go back to the track that he had because he's really young. He's, his head is in the right place. Uh, I was listening to Catalonia Radio uh, last night as well, and everyone who has spoken to him, there were four journalists there that had contacted four people that had, had direct contact with Ansu that day. And uh, basically, he took no time to decide what he needed to do. He was really clear. Um, he obviously was disappointed because you don't really expect any time to get injured. Um, but, you know, his head is in the right place. His family, who are fully behind him, understand that this is part of the life of a footballer. So 100%, in my opinion, it's the best decision to take. And he's taking it the right way as well. He hasn't been forced into doing anything he didn't want to do. In fact, uh, my understanding is that the club actually gave him the option of doing either a straightaway operation or just doing the slower, let's mend it, see if it grows back uh, approach. And he went for the second option, which I, I strongly believe is the right thing to do. Then back to the question. So what, what does Kuman do now? Well, in my eyes, he needs to scrap everything he's done so far and go back to the drawing board because his main reference in attack or one of his regular starters is gone. Um, I would say personally, the best option I would go for one extremo largo, which is a deeper winger, a, wing, a winger that sort of hits the byline, and then one that doesn't. I think that's um, in terms of balance, which is something that Kuman really likes, and I think is, is better for the team, especially when we are not vastly superior. Like, unfortunately, we're not all the time anymore. Um, so for me, based on recent performances, based on potential, and based on the fact that he has actually kept his fitness, that would be Dembele for me. Um, so obviously in my eyes he needs to start on the right so he will be the right winger playing basically like he did in the last game against Betis if you do that then the, the, the right back behind needs to be a little bit more conservative so with that in mind I think the injury to Ansu Fati generates Dembele as a winger and Sergio Roberto being the first option at right back because he provides more balance he's better with building than Dest is even though Dest is a very good player and obviously we've seen that as well if you've got that going on on the right, I think you flip it and switch it on the left. In other words, you put a more control-based winger. Um, Kuman has gone for Pedri lately. I think that's a good option. Uh, once Coutinho is fully fit, I think Coutinho could be a left winger as well. Um, I would say Pedri for me, given the fact that he's got much more potential ahead, should be the, the priority. But obviously Coutinho is a great player as well. So for me, Pedri would be the winger that should make it uh, with Coutinho coming on as a sub. Um, or, or the other way around, but for me, Pedri goes first. And then because you've switched it and flipped it, 
then Jordi Alba gets the start in left back, which I don't think many people would disagree with. But obviously Jordi Alba is the one that zooms forward, is the one that overlaps, is the one that you know has that element of surprise uh, coming from behind. Um, we've spoken this year, especially late in the last month, month and a half, in the podcast about the four-two-three-one that Kuman insists on on having. I don't think this would be the best idea. But when you're introducing a player like Pedri or Coutinho as a winger, then at times that scheme is going to look like a 4-4-2 a lot of the time, especially when in defensive transitions um, and against, you know, major teams or, or teams that are more level with Barca than your, with due respect, your West Cast and your Leganeses, etc. The other option, which I don't think Kuman would go for, uh, but I would, against him in the second half of the table, uh, it would be playing with two, two extremos largos, two deep wingers. And in that case, I think Dembele gets the start. And in the other side, you could have possibly tr- uh, Trincao. Um, even Conrad could get a sniff as well, obviously not as a starter, but I think that he's got potential to play much more than he has. Um, obviously, when you do this, you're arguably playing with four forwards because, as we've seen lately, Griezmann and Messi are sharing the centre of the field, especially since Coutinho has been out. Messi most of the time up front, Griezmann behind. But then at some stage in the game, I don't know if it's via Koeman's, um guidance or just they, they sense what what the rival is doing, but they inter-switch and interlink. So you've got a false nine and you've got a false striker or, or like an attacking midfielder. So they keep rotating. I think that the key to Barca's success, especially with um, Ansu Fati, who is such a reference on the wing and most of the time he's been the left wing, hasn't he? I think that is the rotation. I think it's the unpredictability. And I think as the, the pro- provision of different options. Um, I also want to mention that Braithwaite, obviously, is not really an option that Kuman seems to be trusting. 18 million euros we paid for him not that long ago, and I really have not seen uh, a return that justifies that investment. And, and it really is a huge disappointment because those 18 million euros could really help us now to find a, a better solution. Yeah, on the point to Brothwaite, Frances, I, I don't really trust so much of what he's going to be used for either. To me, it comes down to two basic options. Option one, and this is to the idea that you had about Coleman keeping it very rigid and continuing to play that 4-2-3-1. But again, as you also mentioned that formations, I, I don't want to get too stuck on formations, but I know we're not looking at a 4-3-3, even though we did it against Dinamo Kiev. We know we're not really looking at a 4-3-3, so we are looking at much more of a fluid 4-2-3-1 or a 4-4-2, depending on the positions of certain players and even against Real Betis uh, such an interesting lineup that they had to start without Messi where Dembele was the farthest one forward on the right wing and then you had you had Fati basically as an inside forward almost alongside Griezmann who was playing as a secondary striker and then Pedri was a left midfielder not even a left winger but he was a left midfielder so it was interesting to see that you know don't get too hung up on the numbers we throw at you with a formation just you know general positioning but for me the option as you mentioned, option one uh, basically comes down to, and not to throw out Trincao or Conrad or Brothwaite, but it's how he's going to set up Griezmann, Messi, Dembele, Coutinho, and Pedri. That's really what we're asking here. So option one is, should Coutinho be back after the international break for Atletico Madrid? I think that's pushing Pedri to the left wing with Messi on the right and working in. We've seen him do this already this year, and Griezmann up top with Coutinho in the middle. And then option two would be Coutinho on the left, which I don't really favor. I don't love that. And obviously, that's where he didn't succeed the first time in Barcelona. That's where he has not succeeded this year in the one and a half appearances when he played there. But that would be Coutinho on the left, Messi in the middle, Dembele on the right, and Griezmann up top. So again, it continues to be Dembele on the right. We're going to continue to talk about that. And so I want to finish up this point real quick by giving some love to Brothwaite and Conrad De La Fuente after this break. So I think people are asking as well, when will Conrad De La Fuente make his debut? And you notice that he does keep warming up But Brothway is the one that keeps getting into those late game situations and Barca are constantly in must win. So Brothway will start one or two games now, I think. But I do believe that Conrad will be getting his debut very, very soon with Ansu Fati out. Uh, It was telling to me that even with Ansu Fati before he got hurt, that against Real Betis when Barca B were in a complete injury crisis. And for those real Barca B heads, two major injuries to the right back Solano and Igor, who's a center back who is playing right back. And Sergi Rezanis, who's the 19-year-old right back, he's still out. So that meant that Barca B didn't have a single right back or anybody who had even played the position before. So they put Alfaro Sanz, who is a defensive midfielder or midfielder usually, they put him at right back. And anyway, so Barca B 
had no one in a downpour in Andorra. They lost the three points, but Komen preferred to potentially use Conrad. Instead of sending Conrad to help Barca B, he said, hey, if even if I get this guy three minutes, potentially, not that I'm deciding to put him in, but he might play today. And Barca won 5-2, and so you wonder why didn't Conrad even play in a match that was even 4-2 late on. So anyway, that tells me that he's about to make his debut under the right situation, and Komen is wait- waiting for that right moment, and he's willing to have Barca B not have you know any reinforcements so that he could potentially give him his debut, which is what we want to see. We want to see Conrad De La Fuente get his first team debut, and the whole point of Barca B is to facilitate the first team as we know. So with Ansu out, this could be that right situation, uh, almost forcing Komen's hand to put Conrad De La Fuente out. Because honestly, he's now the only player whose best position is the left wing, which I think is interesting. That is he as good as Coutinho and Pedri on the left wing? Still probably not, but he is the most natural there. So if you are going to go for a 4-2-3-1, and I have my YouTube, here's a plug, I have my YouTube video this week. We're going to be talking about the top of the table leaders at the moment being Real Sociedad. I know Atletico Madrid have a few games in hand, but Real Sociedad, they're doing things the right way right now. And the way they play is basically plug and play, where they have everything rotates around David Silva and the way that everything for us rotates around Messi. But yet you have a, a slew of midfielders that... I mean, you. I, I, there are a lot of names that you're going to have to learn by watching my video. Let's put it that way. And they're the two midfielders that support David Silva. And I think for Barca, it's a lot of the same thing. Where you have Messi, you know where he is. And then I think almost all the other positions of that 4-2-3-1, my, part of the, the problem is that Barca seem to be so dependent on so many of the players that are on the field that you go, well, you can't take them out because then you lose everything that they are. But I mean, for a system that is built around Messi in the way that it is, even in this 4-2-3-1, it should be more plug and play where you need a left winger and Conor De La Fuente is a left winger. So that that thinking dictates why he would play. But speaking of not having a proper left winger and not having enough, Charlie does ask, do you expect any transfer activity in the January window in or out? So we are really here talking about Memphis Depay, are we not? And we're also, as today, depending on when you get this podcast in your ears, we're still wondering the extension for lowering player salaries and getting 190 million euros out of the, uh, off the club's debt to avoid bankruptcy. That's supposed to take place today. So I don't know if they can get another extension or if that will happen. So obviously we're kind of do this, doing this as the news and meetings are going on. But I mean, that's obviously the biggest part of this. And even will a new board come in and say no to Komen getting the guys he wants. But how do you see this this playing out as far as Memphis to buy? Well, let's start with the bankruptcy point you made. Um, I am not for one second worried that Barca is going to go bankrupt or disappear. Um, Barca is way too important to 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 life in in Spain and Catalonia in particular that it will never happen. Um, Barca will stay. Um, Barca may go through you know, dark times. And I think that obviously having the election coming up sooner rather than later, and certainly after Vatumeo's departure, that's obviously great news. There's going to be a period of transition. Now, obviously, we've got Carlos Tusquets, not Busquets, but Tusquets, uh, being the chairman at the moment, um, trying to make sure that all the finances tie up. And uh, he's got a very difficult task of convincing every footballer of reducing their salaries. That Obviously, they've got a contract that he signed. Um, I don't really see that going very well, to be fair, but I do trust there will be other solutions that, you know, Barca will be able to to pull out of the hats. Now, that I said that first because I think that is crucial as to how the transfer market is going to pan out. Um, I think that it's pretty obvious that we need a centre-back and we need uh, someone up front, certainly a striker that is more than good enough to, to not even, I'm not even going to say start because I think that starting ahead of Griezmann or Messi this year is going to be hard, especially with the funds we've got, but someone who could be part of that rotation, someone that, you know, when you've got someone like Ansu Fati, or hopefully it doesn't happen, but either Griezmann or Messi or Coutinho or even Pedri out, uh, you can actually bring them on and, you know, add something different. I think Memphis is someone who, you know, is a goal scorer. I think he's a more pure goal scorer than most of the players we've got in our squad, and I think he would really help. As for the centre-back position, obviously, Eric Garcia is out of a contract in the summer. He has said several times that he wants to join Barca. Um, He's not really renewed his contract with Manchester City. And I think that he would be a a good buy for around a million euros. But at the same time, 
my my heart tells me that if these players really, really, really want to come and they're running out of a contract in the summer, then you just wait up. I think that having Memphis, um, I'm, I'm saying Memphis the buy because he's the one that's been rumored and he's the one that Kuman wants. And if you're not going to give your manager at least one player, then you're not really... You know, you're doing them quite a bit of a disservice. You're not really giving them the reins fully, um, which, you know, it could be five months down the line, the right thing to do. So, in, you know, I know I'm saying a lot of different points that mainly contradict each other, but basically you've got a board that isn't really a board. They're more of a caretaker and let's survive operation. I don't think that they will pull the trigger on any sign-ins, even though that they have gone out to the Catalan radio and actually said that, yes, if needed, we will. I don't think the squad is that desperate for either one of them that I would take the risk of buying someone that the new board coming in in two, three months will not want. Um, and, and I don't really know what they are actually going to do. I know that if it was down to me, I wouldn't sign anybody. Uh, but that's not to say that we don't need them. I think we do need them. But... Um, as I said in the podcast before, and it probably is too defeatist for most of the listeners, but I've got no hope of winning anything this season. And I think that this season has to be a transition that enables us to grow moving forward. Um, so that that's why I'm saying what I'm saying. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I agree with that point. And as far as the money goes, I do agree with you. I mean, Eric Garcia, this is an easy one, that he could sign a pre-contract with his contract ending at Man City, so he'll arrive in the summertime. And we're seeing already that Coleman is very willing to put Frankie de Jong as a center back and put him alongside PK. So PK kind of ha- uh, handles the aerial stuff, and then the build-up comes from de Jong as a center back. And Barca moved the ball quite well with that as a situation. And we're going to talk about Busquets and Pjanic in a bit later on, so... That means that they're the double pivot, and then you got De Young at the center back, and Coleman has been comfortable with that idea. So even while Aronaldo Dorajo is out, and then he'll get healthy. So that's basically what the options are at center back. And as I've said, Coleman does keep going to the Barca B matches and watching when he can. So I think he does keep an eye on some of the players that are going down there. We're seeing Mingueza on the bench, which I don't think, I think he's just a emergency center back. But I do think that uh, Arnaud Comas might even come the the spring if they don't sign anyone could see some Copa del Rey minutes could see again a little bit of rotation in that way so I I think that they will as you said survive um, without a center back and then the number nine position it's so hard to pay for goals when you don't have any money so if the club does wind up spending money on a player because they were able to avoid bankruptcy I mean that's the whole point here that if they're able to avoid bankruptcy and then they're willing to go into a little more debt to sign a player I mean it is worrisome but that would be the nature of this business. So if they are willing to do that, then Memphis Depay, for me, I mean, that's why it's the only answer because it is the guy that come in once. And uh, remember everybody that Barca, Lyon, and Depay thought that he was coming over the summer. All three parties said that he was going to be a Barca player, but the money just wasn't ready, as in it wasn't there. So Lyon this year has played all sorts of formations, and Depay has largely been in the middle, either alone or alongside Moussa Dembele in a 4-4-2. And it was actually the most recent match against St. Etienne where he played on the wing in a front three. So he has shown his versatility throughout his career, sure. But in Lyon, he's been at his best. He's currently in his prime. And you know that he would be an upgrade, obviously, to Brothwaite. But even at this point, as we talked about Griezmann's form, he would be an upgrade to Griezmann just because, I mean, Griezmann's numbers, I saw the most horrifying infographic I think I've ever seen last week, was Ardo Turan, his first what it was, 30 mm-hmm. matches at the club and Griezmann's 30 matches at the club. And they have the same number of goals, but Tehran had like eight or nine more assists, which is just a terrifying thing to do, uh, to say. So Frances, instead of letting you even weigh in on Griezmann, because I, I think that's going to continue to be a talking point, we do have a question from Patreon Ayan for you, not for me here. So he wants the perspective that older Coolidge, and he did, he, I think he circled it and bolded it, and it's got fireworks <laughs> behind it. He said old kool like Frances, uh, and I, I kid, of course, but what did... That's it... not very nice. <laughs> not very nice at all. I am really young at heart. Right, right. You're only, as I said last week, you're only one Ansu Fati, one Pedri, a few Champions League trophies, and... Okay, so during the years before Guardiola, <laughs> what was the perspective of the kool and can you compare where the the state of kool especially those in Catalonia, where were the expectations and hopes of the clubs at during the Laporta years and how did that change during the Roselle and Bartomeu years? Okay, so let's just go back to the Van Gaal years uh, with, you know, Joan Gaspar, etc. 
um, they Barca were nowhere really. Uh, they had several great players. Uh, Giovanni was good at the time. Rivaldo was good at the time. Uh, we had several Dutch players that were, in my eyes, pretty good, um, like Koku, for example. Um, Overmars was decent as well at one point. Uh, Luis Enrique was very good. You had the young Xavi and Puyol uh, coming through like Pedri and Ansu Fati are doing now. So th- they were good players, but, you know, it was... Um, it was a defeatist um, environment. Uh, players haven't really won much at all. And, uh, you know, Madrid were going through the Galactico era. So it was very, very hard as a culé to, to compare uh, what your team could do with what, you know, Zidane, Beckham, Ronaldo, Roberto Carlos, and, you know, that guy, that Portuguese guy, that number seven at Barca that left us, can't remember his name, you know, that, the, 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 the guy. Can't remember his name. So they were winning trophies, they were winning Champions League, and uh, it was really, really difficult to to go through these years. Um, obviously, Barça and Madrid they've always polarizing. So you always compare as a culé, you always balance how greatly your team is doing by also comparing to how badly Madrid are doing. Um, it's uh, yin yang, you know. It's uh, one goes up, one goes down, and at the, at the time was really, really difficult. So. When the election happened in 2003, you had Juan Laporta saying he was going to bring David Beckham. Uh, and we thought that was tremendous. Um, everyone was behind them. Then Beckham ended up going to Real Madrid by rejecting us. And Laporta managed to get Ronaldinho. Um, I say Laporta. That was Laporta and Roussel together. Word in the street has it that it was more Roussel than Laporta, to be honest. But, you know, between the both of them, who were in the same candidacy and the same uh, presidency eventually, they brought uh, Ronaldinho back to the club. And Ronaldinho was a winner. He was a happy smile. You know, he was always positive. Um, He brought a flair of magic that we hadn't really seen at the Camp Nou for many, many years. And uh, the whole whole environment changed. Uh, We went to the Bernabeu. And Ronaldinho managed to lead Barca to a 0-3 victory at the time. Um, the, the It's very famous now, but the guy that, you know, was clapping his goals from the stands, the guy with the moustache, I'm sure you can YouTube this. When Ronaldinho scores the last goal of the game uh, with Iker Cartilla saying, you know, que pasa, es que lo flipo, like, you know, what's happening, I'm hallucinating, what's going on? Um, that's the that's the time when everything changed, you know. Um, we didn't really win much on the first season, but then that was, you know, then came uh, 2006, uh, Champions League final uh, and the wins and the growth. Um, Edgar David's coming on at some stage as well, giving the midfield something that we didn't have. Obviously, Xavi absorbing everything and growing in his own way. Then Guardiola doing incredibly well with Barca B, um, getting people like Busquets and Pedro to be protagonists. Um, him, as a manager, getting the chance, uh, thanks to Laporta, to you know manage the, the first team, bringing on those youngsters. You've got, at the same time, you've got Luis Aragonés taking the reins of the Spanish national team, which really transformed Xavi. And you got the Xavi from the national Spanish team back into Barca. Uh, you had Deco at the time as well that made Xavi better. Iniesta was learning behind the scenes. And, you know, everything was happening. And that was a very, very exciting time because, you know, we had the we had the makings of a fantastic, legendary team just growing in front of your eyes. And uh, so there was a transition that was difficult. But once Laporta um, put all the pieces together, and Guardiola managed to find the, the best spot for Messi and surrounding him as a youngster, but surrounding him with fantastic players. You know, like our right back was Dani Alves, arguably the best right back in the history of football. Um, so Cafu will allow us to say that. You've got um, Abidal on the left, who was solid. He was creative. He was uh, eventually a World Cup winner as well. You had Puyol, that was a rock. You had a young Gerard Pique, and even before that, you had Yaya Touré, who could play either in Busquets' position, but when Busquets got a protagonist role, he moved back to uh, to the centre-back, and he was very solid there. You had Rafael Márquez. I know we've got a lot of listeners from Mexico and the United States. He was fantastic there, etc., etc., etc. I mean, I could go on for hours, but basically it was a very exciting time when everything clicked, but the years before were very, very difficult, especially because Madrid were winning so much and so well. Yeah, and as I said, too, I think that just comparing Laporta and Roselle slash Bartomeu is a difference between listening to Cruyff and then Cruyff obviously passing away. But uh, basically listening to Cruyff and having him in the ear of Laporta, basically having that vision and having those ideas floating around the club 
And then you notice that there is a change. And I think one of the, as I said, to go back to Bartomeu, which is where kind of the story ends, that one of the biggest indictments of Bartomeu as president is that you look at the way that the legends, uh, you consider in Carlos Puyol uh, as well here, where the way that these legends are talking about Barca's board and administration at the moment, there certainly is a disconnect with not only the players on the field, obviously we know how much Messi hated Bartomeu, but not only is it the players on the field, but it's the ethos of the club that seems to be diametrically opposed to what Bartomeu is kind of spitting out behind the scenes as well. I think it comes down to something very simple that I don't really hear many people saying. Laporta understands football. He loves football and he loves football being played the right way. You can argue that Sandro Rosset is the same. He is a football man. He was, uh, you know, he was also a very successful businessman. He was involved with Nike and uh, he knew players really well. He, he built relationships. But ultimately, he also understood football and he also is a Barca fan. You know, he played football himself growing up. So both Laporta and Rosset were footballers themselves and they love football being played the right way. That is something that Bartomeu just does not have. You know, you can argue that he's been successful in his businesses, not that successful as Barca, as we've been saying for the last two, three months. So there's no need to go into that anymore. But Bartomeu really is a basketball player and who played for Espanyol. So that's all you need to know. I, I know we're going to talk about Real Madrid in a second here. I'm, I'm giving a little bit of a tease to what's coming next. But yeah, truly, that Bartomeu was involved in construction, very much like the president of Real Madrid. And the main reason why he wanted being in Laporta's board was because of his relationship with Roselle. Roselle was the one whose resume got him onto Laporta's board as they had met each other and known each other. But Bartomeu was merely a, an extension of Roselle because they had met years prior in school and they kind of had remained friends. And as uh, with the Catalan elites, because of business dealings, Bartomeu was kind of around the same circles. He winds up, Roselle kind of brings him with him and that's how he first gets on the board. So yeah, it was uh, not necessarily a match made in heaven. And then obviously an accident that Bartomeu wound up being the board because of what happened with Roselle. So let's Let's put that one to bed again because we're going to focus once again on the squad here. Abbas, Ray, and Tom, all questions about the squad. Abbas saying, is Coleman not completely convinced of death and others in their position or he's simply loyal to the Catalans? And I think the ones he's referring to, obviously, are Sergio Roberto and Sergio Busquets. Ray, what does Pjanic have to do to get regular playing time? How can he acclimate if Busi is in every match? And Tom, what's the situation with Busquets? Why is he getting so much game time? So I want to kind of answer all of this in one fell swoop, and then you can respond, Frances, that mm -hmm. I, I look at the Real Madrid dressing room at the moment and Zidane's dressing room. Real Madrid have not been great either. They're also in a transition period. But Zidane, I notice, and you'll notice that he plays Marcelo. And for those that watched another U.S. men's national team call-up, just like Des and Conrad de la Fuente this time around, uh, Yunus Musa against Valencia when Real Madrid just got, you know, lambasted at the penalty spot 4-1, Marcelo was nowhere near Ferlin Mendy's level. He's clearly the backup, clearly a, a level way down. But Zidane does still give some of those old guard players minutes to keep the dressing room. And this is how it is everywhere, though. It's not just that Barca have this hierarchy of Messi and Pique and Busquets and Roberto uh, and, the, I mean, basically the captains that we're talking about there. But uh, even after the Benzema and Vinicius Jr. drama was released about Benzema apparently saying not to pass to him, which I think as far as the team controversies... That one beats anyone that Barca have had so far this year. I mean, other than Messi versus Bartomeu. But Benzema has the power in that locker room. And the younger player, that being Vinicius Jr., he was the one that had to get over it, even though Benzema was the one that you'd say was in the wrong. But And, and that would happen at Barca. If, if Fati or Pedri or one of these younger players spoke up that there was an issue, it would be on them to have to fix their issue and kind of... I mean, that's why you don't hear a peep from... I mean, it's the fans who are yelling about, and Minor and Albert asked the questions about Ricky Puj, but I, that's why Ricky Puj, you don't hear a peep out of him complaining about playing time. Not a peep. Because the Barca dressing room, and this is, thankfully, it's not the same as it was with Xavi and Iniesta and Puyol, but you get that there is still a sense that when you walk in that dressing room as a younger player, there's a reverence to the older players that needs to exist from the younger players. They can still earn their minutes, but you have to. there has to be some respect, there, and Ricky Puj has that. Problematically, though, you get what happened with Pjanic this weekend where 
his social media response says basically questioning, hey, why am I on the bench? He just put out, for those who didn't see it, some some dot, 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 and then pictures of him on the bench. You know, So obviously, we're, we saw the same thing from Arturo Vidal last season, and then he becomes absolutely indispensable, almost rewarded for saying, hey, I'm upset with what's going on here. And Pjanic is not one of those young players. The young players have no clout, so they have to fall in line, or it's over for you and you're out of the club. But for, for Pjanic, an experienced player like that, he can cause problems in a hurry. And for Zidane, it just doesn't happen that way because he'll just play the old guard. And whatever that dressing room, whatever situation it's in, is that uh, love him or hate him, there is a hierarchy there. Same thing with Bayern Munich. As, as we said, that Manuel Neuer has ruined young players' careers. by And, and same thing with Thomas Muller, where they've said, hey, you don't belong here. You're, not, you're never going to make it. You're not good enough. And if you wilt under that mental pressure then they're done. So we do talk about catering to the young players, but these big clubs don't do that. So for Pjanic, it's interesting that, you know, we're, we're seeing De Young at center back, as I mentioned earlier, even more. That means more of Busquets. There's a difficulty of playing the double pivot. And to go back to why we aren't seeing some of the younger players and they, they are opting for Busquets, that being Coleman, uh, I, I, there's just too much ground for those two players in general to cover the double pivot. Uh, and even though Busquets can't cover that ground, I think Coleman does trust his connections and communication with his longtime teammates. And his experience over the young players as Coleman is desperate for wins and desperate for results to have any chance of remaining the manager at FC Barcelona. So I know Barca did lose El Clasico, but when there's been bad results, you can say that Barca haven't finished their chances and they've really beaten themselves this year. So as much as this is a transition year where results haven't been there, you can't say that Barca have been the worst team in almost any match this season other than El Clasico. And even then, they weren't run off the pitch. They just lost that match. So I can't think of a match under Coleman where Barca completely got ripped apart. So I think the fear is that Alenia, Puj, or I mean, again, Mateus Fernandez, sure, uh, if they lose their bearings in a match, it could lead to a landslide. And I think that is the fear from Komen. For those of us that have watched Barca now and understand what Alenia and Puj and those players bring to the table, I, we know that they wouldn't wilt and it wouldn't happen that way. But I think that is certainly a fear from Komen that one of these younger players will be the, will be the difference between a, a 2-1 win and a 3-2 loss. And I think that is why he continues to trust in Busquets. And I think we're also kind of changing the the parameters of what we expect from Busquets. He was good against Real Batiste as well. And that was a more open game. And I, I, I think that we're going to continue to see that, though, because he's going to rely on a player like Busquets. The only way that Busquets and Roberto don't wind up continuing to get major minutes is if they're not in the club because they occupy too much of an important part of that team. And I think the more pressing issue is that even if Pjanic on a merit base should play over Busquets right now, he's not. And as a professional, he kind of has to do, he, he has to figure that out. Or I, I think that that's, that's going to be the issue, that he cannot be the virus in this dressing room and sour things. I agree. I agree. I don't have too much to add because you've pretty much hit every point that I was going to make. Um, I'm just going to simplistically say that Serginho Des will play a lot more if Dembele wasn't the person in front. Uh, and I've already spoken about this in this podcast, so I'm not going to repeat myself, but I think that Sergio Roberto provides more balance uh, from a defensive perspective, not necessarily defending as such, but having more control. Obviously, Des is more offensive, he's more unpredictable. I, th- I, think, I think he's faster, and I think that long-term, he's a better option at right-back. But I think that he hasn't been at the club that much. He doesn't have those connections and that hierarchy in the dressing room, as you just explained, just yet. So I think that's why, you know, he's not always starting ahead of Sergio Roberto. I think that if you play Trincao up front, who is also attacking but doesn't hit the byline, then Des has got a better chance of playing at right back. And obviously, Serginho can play in either side. But when you have Jordi Alba as a fullback on the left then you're not really going to be ahead of him, um, especially not just yet, and especially when he's fit. Um, we can criticize Jordi Alba for many, many reasons, but I still think he's a top five left back in the whole of the world, really. Um, I think he even is higher up that, that picking order when Messi plays and Messi looks for him, which is pretty much all the time. So I don't think Serginho Dest uh, has any other option but to be patient and continue to grow. As for Pjanic, um, I think that I don't know. I keep saying this, but I'm not on social media and I really don't see the point. I don't think that doing anything, any messages by social media should help your reputation. It's not a professional thing to do. And and if you want to have a dig at your manager, you should be man enough to say to their face or just shut up about it. Basically, I don't think social media messages mean anything or should mean anything or should be given any repercussion. I understand the world has changed. I understand the world um, prioritizes you know, 
people doing stupid dances on TikTok and, and things like that, fine. I'm not part of that. I don't want to be part of that. And I know I'm in the minority here probably. But I think that if you've got a problem with your manager, you need to say. And if you don't have to say it to your manager, then you just have to shut up. Yep. Yeah. So, yeah, we agree there. We'll have continue to have the argument about Alenia and Puj being able to play and getting minutes. And why is Busquets continually playing all these minutes? And I agree that there are opportunities and circumstances where... I, I think these younger players have deserved minutes and not only because they've deserved them, but because Busquets has not necessarily been playing up to his level because I, and I, again, the argument of Busquets is not whether or not he still has it because he still has something left in the tank, but it's how he's being utilized. And it goes all the way back to the point I made in the very first answer that this club seems to be completely dependent, not only on Messi, but also on Busquets and also on PK and also on Alba. So with so many of those figures, having a team need to be built around them. The problem you get is that some of them have to play where it's not all about them and they're fitting a role they don't necessarily fit to accommodate other players. And Griezmann is the exact same way where Griezmann, to get the best out of him, you need him to not be playing next to Messi, but Messi is going to play and you have to play Bus- uh, You have to play Griezmann. Because of the way that, and I know people have been making a lot about Messi not uh, walking for a little bit and that that, that clip went viral, but he's been walking for 10 years, and that's messy. And we see from the advanced metrics, and we even see with our eyes that he's still the best player in the world. So you have to make see, sure you're accommodating what Messi's doing behind the ball. And I think that's the problem with Busquets, though, that Busquets doesn't necessarily fit anymore behind what Messi provides in front of him on the defensive end of things, and that exposes Busquets. So, but again, it's a, it's a, the problem is that you're not going to drop Messi, and you're not going to drop Busquets. So you have to kind of make do with what you have with both of those two players playing together. Exactly. And also, you don't have any money to really sign anyone sure. um, of the caliber that you need in order to replace these players. So I'm not saying Pjanic does not deserve to play. I think that long term, um, again, his long term is not short term because, as you mentioned, Busquets will be the starter for the foreseeable future. But I think long term Pjanic could be a, a solution moving forward. Obviously, I don't think getting coronavirus straight away when he signed for Barca, when he was meant to start training, helped him. My understanding is from the media in Catalonia that he didn't reach his required level of fitness um, straight away, obviously. Um, you know, he had corona, so he, you know, he, he couldn't. Um, but he's taken him longer than they expected to get back to the required level. And uh, I think that he's going to slowly but surely get more minutes. But he cannot really, he cannot really expect to be playing straight away. This is Barca. Not everyone can come and, and be a starter. And uh, I don't think that he's done enough to, to be a regular starter ahead of Busquets based on what he's shown, what he's played. Yeah, and that's a great point actually about the COVID that we saw in the NBA in particular, Russell Westbrook had come back from COVID and we're seeing all over the world that uh, even Cristiano Ronaldo, that COVID, you can't, even these professional athletes, this is a serious thing where even if they recover from it and obviously they, they had a clean bill of health, they're given the green light, they're not the same. So many of these players who have COVID, even Russell Westbrook, who's one of the best athletes in the entire world at any sport, he was not right. And he's, I mean, he might be right now coming with the NBA starting in a month and a half from now, but all throughout that playoffs, and he admitted after the fact that it's not even a matter of being hurt, but you're, it's not even, and, and you can say, you we call it fitness, sure, but they're just not the same. Physically, you're not the same, and it's difficult to do. So when you look at Tadebo currently at Benfica, we'd be saying, hey, why is, wouldn't he be playing if he was around? Well, he got COVID too, and Umtiti had COVID, and you're wondering, how come Umtiti, yes, it might be about his knee and all that, but having COVID is making it so difficult for Umtiti to wind up getting his fitness back. So that's actually a big point about COVID that as cases are rising again around the world and there's another international break at almost a worse time, if you wind up having a Messi or a yeah, Messi, God forbid, but almost any of these players who are going out on international duty, Busquets and Roberto for Spain, if any of these players catch COVID on the way back, I mean, do not expect them to be themselves for a little bit of time. And I think we're almost underrating because we're saying, oh, it's just some kind of illness. And we're not considering that it has lasting effects on what happens on the field. We think that just once they step over those magical lines and they step onto the field, that 
they feel perfect and everything is working, but that's not the case. So I completely agree with that point about COVID. And I think we're almost underestimating the effect that it's not only having on individual players, but it's having on entire teams. And it's going to happen, the effect it's going to have on world football, that the team at the end of the day with the Liga or Champions League, the team that are holding those trophies might wind up the, the being the teams that had the least number of COVID cases and had the least number of players missing due to injuries because they're playing too much and they're playing th- every three days because the schedule is truncated. So those are things that, yeah, they sound like excuses for individual teams because everyone is dealing with them, but the teams that and the, and the clubs that wind up navigating that the best are going to be the ones that do well. And I think the final point here, Frances, that I'll let you end the show with is the fact that Barca have put themselves in a mess to not be able to deal with it. It's the same thing when you talk about money that, you know, those who will say the difference between rich and wealthy, rich people are those who have the fancy cars and who have, who show you the money that they made. But the wealthy ones are the ones that are prepared and have the savings in times of crisis and are the ones who are always going to be okay. And the ones that at the end of their lives, you see the fortunes that they had built over time. And right now, Barca are not a wealthy club. They are a rich club, a rich club that is has had the fancy Coutinho and Griezmann signings and the big press conferences, but they do were not prepared for not only when they stretch themselves too thin under Bartomeu, but that they as a club financially were not prepared, obviously, for a global pandemic, even in ways that some clubs were, that some clubs like a Bayern Munich had a little bit of a nest egg prepared for if things go bad and when you have to spend money and Barca just didn't have any money left. And then a pandemic hit that slashed all those finances. So again, it's disappointing to me that Barca are a rich club and not a wealthy club. And that is going to hurt them as, again, it just sounds like an excuse, but this is a situation that Barca put themselves in. For sure. And it all comes down to leadership. I think that when you're led by someone who isn't really forward thinking and is just living for the moment and also reactive to what the media keeps saying um, time and time again, um, that's not really going to work very well. Um, also, when you re- in this obviously we're talking about Bartomeu, clearly, um, he's surrounding himself by <laughs> yeah, people. I think we are. Yeah, yeah, for sure. For sure. So he's surrounded himself by different people who were not the best at their jobs. Um, Zubizarreta is the only one who had sort of a clue. He's the last one, the last sporting director who actually signed players who were worth keeping, like Ter Stegen, like Rakitic, like Luis Suarez, even though, you know, anyone with their eyes closed would have been able to, sw- to sign Luis Suarez, for example. But then Abidal didn't really do very much, Jordi Mestra, and etc., etc., etc. So there were a lot of mistakes made along the way. And those mistakes were made because the clear direction was not towards what Barca should stand for, which is attacking football, a way of playing and trusting La Masia uh, to, 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 to nurture the first, first team and then be sprinkled with the best players from around the world. Um, so that for a start, but then when you are going for these hugely expensive signings, if you don't hit the spot, then that could hurt you forever. And, you know, I think that even though they're still in the club and even though they're trying to still reach their potential, I think we could say that Coutinho, Dembele and Griezmann were all misses, really, um, sorry to say. Um, but that's, that's what reality today has shown us. Hopefully, all of them three are still in the club. They have got the chance to redeem themselves this season, and hopefully they do. But for what they've shown so far, you can say that the biggest signings, the most expensive signings they've had, have been paid for way above the market value, and they have not responded. La Masia was, wasn't nurtured. Uh, from an economic perspective, there wasn't, there wasn't anything more than the day-to-day expenses uh, being covered and you know it's a large etc you can talk about the uh, unhappiness and the disconnect from the club the way that it has been run with the with the entorno with the saucies and not just the saucies but the barca fans around the world and all of these needed to change obviously bartomeu is gone obviously we've got carlos tusquets doing the transition hopefully he hurries up a little bit more so that the election can come sooner rather than later and that whoever takes over uh, can actually, you know, get a cleaner slate. Um, it's never going to be totally clean because they have to clean up the mess as soon as they, you know, take the reins of the club. But it will be better than what it is today. They can come in with a plan that hopefully the sources this time get it right and they vote for the right candidate to lead things the right way and they can build forward towards the future. Um, I'm not even talking about this season. I'm talking from next season onwards because that would have been you know, next season's planning would have been impacted by the new board's decisions. Um, so that's where we are today. Um, I am hopeful that 
this season players like Pedri obviously Ansu Fati is now injured but he's gonna he's gonna come back and you know he's gonna continue to grow Araujo getting more playing time someone like the young establishing himself as a regular starter um, someone like Serginho there's getting more playing time um, etc 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 so I think that we are planting the seeds for something great in the future but I don't think we can push for the present just yet because we just don't have the tools at the moment yep yep uh, the point I close it on is that continuity has been one of the reasons why certain clubs are top of table or why certain clubs are doing better than others around world football. It's not just even in Spain, that the ones who have stayed with a plan. So again, that's a plug for uh, one of the reasons why I'm giving you a little teaser there. One of the reasons why Real Sociedad are doing so well this year. And one of the things that Barca might be able to learn from them. So speaking of continuity, we have had the continuity of 227 shows. And I think this ends episode 227. We'll be back next week for episode 228. So thank you so much for tuning in. Again, you can tap in your app and check out the show notes to subscribe. Find us on social media, on Twitter, at the Barcelona Pod. We're at HitTheMD13 for me. On Instagram, at the Barcelona Pod. Our closed Facebook group where we got these questions from, the listener questions, is tbpod.link backslash group. And you can help us out on Patreon. You also get your question guaranteed answered there for as low as $3 at tbpod.link backslash Patreon. And we're on YouTube that I've plugged as well, where I've got specialty content that is more of a video format, if you will. That's the Barcelona Podcast. So check us out there and hit that subscription button. And thanks so much for listening to this edition of the Barcelona Podcast. Until next time, we'll talk to you soon. Forza Barca. Forza. Barca.